Hey there, everyone in Serial Killer Country. My name is Brittany Ransom. And my name is Brian. And this is When Killers Get Caught, a podcast devoted to deep dives into the lives and psyches of the killers we love to learn about. Each week we'll discuss something new and interesting in the serial killer world. Then we'll discuss one well-known or lesser-known killer and go deep into their childhood, lives, methodology, and most importantly, how they got caught. And then, because most serial killer fans love a little spook, Brian will lead us down the road of the paranormal cryptids or something that he found to be particularly creepy. This week we're talking about news updates on uh, America's most prolific serial killer, then Dr. Marcel Pichot, the French serial killer most active during World War II, and then Brian will be doing... I'll be covering... Uh, James Dean and the Curse of Little Bastard. Oh, wow. (laughs) But before we begin, When Killers Get Caught is sponsored by the Magic Class Boutique, a small handmade jewelry company that specializes in cute and creepy earrings. They're actually working on a series of earrings for When Killers Get Caught that should be out at the end of the month. There will be different kinds of knives and cleavers and other items that people use to kill each other. But until then, if you'd like to support the podcast, you can stop by www.themagicclass.com and use the code CAUGHT to get 15% off of your entire order. Thanks so much, The Magic Class, for being our sponsor. And in big news right now, America's most prolific serial killer has died only a couple days ago. Yeah. I still think it's COVID. <laughs> well, as of right now, they only know that it's he died of something in the hospital on December 31st, 2020, uh, or is it December 30th? 30th. December 30th. Uh, if you don't know who this person is, uh, his name is Samuel Little. And he has 60 confirmed victims so far because they're still finding connections to people he murdered decades ago across the country. Yes, he's actually claimed to have killed 93. Yeah. And I guess... That seems like such a small number because, you know, we have our Ted Bundy's and other people who claim to have killed over 100 women. But right. they all they, claim. Right. But they can never confirm those people. Mm. Here we have actually been collecting DNA, DNA evidence over the years. And we know it was at least 60. Yeah. Yeah. You gotta love those uh, DNA kits. <laughs> and The ones that never get actually tested. Yes. Those ones. <laughs> <laughs> That's so jacked up. Um, but... I don't know what else to say about this guy. Uh, he was a boxer. And uh, you were just telling me before we started recording that he uh, had a thing for necks. He had a he had a thing for necks as an <laughs> early child. <laughs> what and, do you do about that when your child... I don't know. <laughs> just <laughs> keep him away from me? <laughs> yeah, I'm not entirely sure. He had a thing for necks. Uh, he also had a thing for prostitutes. Those were the majority of his victims, people who he thought nobody was going to be looking for. And since he was, a, I guess, a boxer, I guess we're saying he was some kind of a celebrity. I didn't really know anything about him. Did you know he was arrested 26 times in 11 states? No, but what you did show me was the horrible, <laughs> ugly photos of the women that he killed. He like drew pictures of them. In was it in prison? They're horrific. I, I don't know. I just saw them, and I will have nightmares tonight. If anybody's watching this on YouTube, I will definitely throw up these photos on the YouTube video because they're horrible. They're like I don't know some sort of abstract vision of women he wanted to kill. Exactly. They're, they're like children's crayon drawings of people who they know, but not really. <clears throat> And apparently he spent half his life murdering people from 1970 to 2005, which is wild because I feel like I don't remember hearing about him. I was only just getting out of high school when this guy got, yeah, when he got caught. And I was in high school. You're only a year behind me. Stop it. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, apparently uh, so far California state corrections have only said he just died from something in the hospital. I was like, did he die from COVID? It has to be COVID. What else? I they, don't know. They, they have small quarters. You know, there's, there's, no, there's no social distancing. This is yeah. I can't talk. <laughs> no this social is, distancing in prison. No, not at all. Uh, one thing we do know is that he did used to, like, knock out his victims, like, with a hard, like, right hook before he strangled them. Which means that there weren't always obvious signs that the person had actually been murdered. Mm-hmm. Which is why we didn't know so many of them were, you know, 
Um, and I guess the FBI finalized like in 2019 or that uh, many of his confessions were actually the truth. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so my thought process is, is, did he really actually kill all 93 then? I mean, that's a really specific number. But I guess that's the biggest uh, thing. And he didn't even get arrested. He didn't even get arrested for being a serial killer. He got arrested for being a dr- for drugs. Yeah. <laughs> and then they did a DNA test on him. And that's why we need to do all these DNA tests across America. That's why 23 and me get the ancestry done. That's no, the- that is why I won't get the ancestry <laughs> DNA 23 and me thing done. Because I don't like that the government can just take your DNA. Okay, but it helps though. I know that it's very conspiracy but I still don't like that the government will just request your oh DNA. My God. There's something that they, yeah, people, people will. They don't like that. Of course not. <laughs> I, I feel like your DNA, your your body DNA, should still be something that you have to use a request. I feel like if I ever get caught being a serial killer, ever, and it's through me doing like Ancestry or 23 Me, I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. Okay. Whatever. No, you're not. No, you're not. <laughs> All right. Well, what we're going to do right now is we're going to move into the main segment, which is that tonight I'm going to be leading you on a journey with, we're going to learn about a doctor by the name of Marcel Pichot, and he is a French serial killer. He's also been called Dr. Satan, and he was charged with 27 murders, convicted of 26, but he admitted to more than 60. The big thing that brought me to this guy is the way that he was caught and the fact that he insisted until his death that all of his victims were Germans or German sympathizers. Okay. Right. So the thing is, if he had actually done that, if if he had, if he had actually done that, he would have been one of those people we talk about in awe right now. Like, oh, he's a Nazi. Yeah. Look at this guy. He killed all these Nazis. How cool. Glorious like, bastard shit. Yeah, like those three women who used to lure Nazis into the woods and kill them. Like, he would be one of those people, but he's not. He's not. But we're going to start with the beginning of his life, which is that he was born January 17th, 1897. And like most serial killers, he had a lot of problems in his childhood. It starts out primary school. He has a lot of trouble with violence, inappropriate sexual behavior. And this one, this one was really so good. He's 11 years old, okay? He brings his father's gun to school, propositions another 11-year-old for sex, and then shoots off the gun to tell her he's serious. Yes. Um, But that didn't get him in trouble. Um, But as a teenager, he begins small crimes, theft, destruction of property, that sort of thing. He gets arrested officially for the first time at 17, trying to rob a post office box. So, wait. What? I don't know why you would do that. Did he see something he liked? I don't know. <laughs> like, can you imagine trying to, like, steal from a blue post office box in America? No, you can't. You can steal people's bills and Christmas cards? I mean, you can steal all my bills if you want to pay them. Go ahead. <laughs> but either way, uh, they recommend that he be evaluated by a psychiatrist. And this will not be the first time this happens in this man's life. Then he's de- they determine he's suffering from some mental illness. And they drop the charges. We're in, it's 1914 now. He actually gets expelled so many times during his school career that they have to send him to a special academy in Paris, and he graduates in 1915. So despite all of this, he joins the French army in World War I, entering service January 16th. Now during the Second Battle of N, he gets wounded and gassed, and he begins to show the symptoms of what they called then a breakdown, which is post-traumatic stress disorder. It's the spring of 1917, so they mentally assess him again, and they send him in for treatment. While under psychological care, he gets arrested for theft, this time for stealing blankets, morphine, wallets, photographs, and letters from other patients. They drop the charges after diagnosing him with something called mental equilibrium, neurasthenia, mental depression, melancholia, obsessions, and phobias. Now, I had to look these up because I've never heard of these diagnoses before. I just like melancholia. I know, right? (laughs) (laughs) So neurasthenia is this old-timey medical condition where pretty much you just get headaches, fatigue, you're irritable, disturbed. I feel like I have neurasthenia. I think everybody has yeah. that. That's a thing. That's just life. I don't know why this was a special term, but the mental equilibrium is interesting 
Now, uh, this is a real thing right now, but back then, what they considered mental equilibrium was a condition where your mental state and the environment is off. So your brain is taking in stimulation from the world around you, but you are not interpreting it correctly. So pretty much he was having some sort of delusions. Hmm. And then melancholia seems to be what we would call major depressive disorder. Oh, okay. Pretty yeah. simple. It was yeah. just uh, super sadness is what they called it, apparently. Melancholia. You have been I, diagnosed with super sadness. I definitely have been. <laughs> <laughs> likewise, likewise, my friend. Okay, so however being given six different diagnoses, this does not stop you from being called back during a war because they sent him to the front lines of battle again in 1918. But this time he's like, no, I'm done and shoots himself in the foot. That, that's smart right there. Like, okay, front lines, no. How many peel some potatoes or something? Or Right? Know. He could have done anything. He could have been a chef for the war. He could have been a radio operator. But no, send a crazy guy out front. He'll be fine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, he gets put in a different regiment in September, and then they send him for a psych evaluation again. This time, they discharge him with a disability. And in fact... On his military discharge papers, they recommend that he be committed to an asylum. At this point, this man is like only 20 years old. <laughs> but instead, no, 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 no. They did not admit him into asylum. They allowed him to join an accelerated education program for veterans. And here he becomes a doctor. Okay, see, this is your problem. This is, this is their fault. This, this is their fault. You had all these signs in front of you and you just, no, 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 no. Push him aside. Go right ahead. Go right I know. Ahead. We have a lot of sides here, but we're not even at the craziest parts of the story yet. <laughs> so after the war, he gets his credentials. He is now Dr. Marcel Pichot. He moves to villeneuve sur yon in 1921, and he gets a lot of patients, and he's considered to be a very charming, intelligent, trusted doctor. In reality, though, he's pretty corrupt, and he's been purposely prescribing highly addictive drugs to his patients while secretly applying for medical assistance for the patients. So he can get paid twice by both the government of France and his patients who are paying out of pocket. He's also addicted to narcotics himself at this point and has gained a reputation for petty theft and performing illegal abortions. Mm. So now we talk about what is thought to be his first official murder. He has an affair with a patient's teenage daughter in 1926. He's in his like late 20s at this point. Her name is Louise, Louise Delavay. And Louise disappears in the May of 1926. The neighbors report seeing Pichot put a very large trunk in his car. Exactly the same kind of trunk that they pull out of the Yon River just a few weeks later. That just so happens to be full of women's body parts. So, did the neighbors report this? Yes, they did. Okay, sweet. Okay. And the French <laughs> police say that it's a coincidence. And Delevay is officially logged as a runaway. Fuck. <laughs> What? No. Despite this scandal, he would run for mayor and he wins after he hires someone to heckle his opponent during his speeches. So, <laughs> campaign interference. Yep, yep, yep. Campaign <laughs> interference it is. Oh my goodness. And he still won. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> So then in 1928, he married Georgette Lebelier. She's the 23-year-old daughter of a wealthy landowner, and they have a son named Gerhard, who's born in April of 1928. But if you think his time as the mayor was easy, aha, it was not. He's accused of stealing, stealing taxpayer money. He's accused of stealing oil from the railroad department. That one he actually got convicted for and sentenced to three months in jail, but it gets overturned in appeals. This uh, he gets a suspension as mayor for four months, and he ends up staying there until 1931. Now, despite the constant complaints of theft in the office as mayor, he wins a seat on the general council, which would make him the youngest man to do so in villeneuve sur yon history, where he goes right back to government stealing. Nice. <clears throat> he gets charged with stealing power from the city. I don't even know how you do that. Well, he, first you get like a very long extension cord and you just still you just the, the, the city the next city over you just pull it you know pull the energy from them i don't know and i'm just, like was he just not paying the electric bills was he like cranking up the the bill that the city was probably you know, charging like, the bill and yeah. then keeping the money himself 
he seems like someone who was, you know, pretty into fraud. So yeah. I feel like this was right. A lot of embezzlement. Um, big issue with kleptomania, this man. But he gets fined for stealing the power, and he loses his seat on the he loses his seat on the council. And this is when he decides, you know what I should do? I'm gonna move to Paris. Have you ever wanted to make a podcast? Well, it's pretty easy with Anchor.fm. If you haven't heard of Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast online right now, and it's completely free. There are creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more podcasting websites. You can make money from your podcast, and you don't need to have a minimum listenership. It's everything that you need to make a podcast in one place. And it's super simple. Just download the free Anchor app on your phone or go to anchor.fm and you can get started today. Thanks to anchor.fm for sponsoring When Killers Get Caught. Okay, so here we are. It's Paris, 1933. He's only killed one person so far in his career. This is not exactly serial killer vibes. Uh, He's been growing out his medical practice, and on the surface, he is a doctor with an impeccable reputation. A reputation that he used fake credentials to get. But the rumors start in Paris that he is making his patients addicts. He's performing illegal abortions again. So this goes on for the next couple years. In 1936, He's appointed to what's called the Médecin d'État Civil, which is the person who has the authority to write death certificates in the town. Hmm. Uh, I guess that would be the equivalent of like our, not a medical examiner, but the person above that person. Is it a medical examiner? No. But it's the, the person who has the, <clears throat> the end of the chain decides exactly, like they write everything on the death certificate. You mean the coroner? Yes, like the coroner's okay. reports. Yeah, that's kind of the job that he would get at this point. Um, he still can't keep his kleptomania under control and he's arrested for both theft and assaulting a police officer. But this time when he's evaluated, they say that he's insane and they institutionalize him for a year. This would be the first time he has been officially like institutionalized for a long period of time. And the first time they suggested that it was years ago. Yeah. They suggested it when he got out of the military and when he was in the military, they kept him in for a couple months, but not enough. Mm. But he gets released. And his doctors are very unsure whether he's stable enough to be around society. But that doesn't change the fact that they let him out anyway. He commits tax fraud immediately and gets fined and charged for these crimes. So by the time Germany invades France in 1939, this guy has a massive criminal record and a long list of psychiatric diagnoses. And the thing is, when the Germans first settle in France, he establishes himself as a member of the resistance, and he's actually doing, like, really good things. He provides false medical records and disability certificates for people who are being forced into German labor camps. So essentially, he's creating these documents to say, like, oh, this person can't do hard labor. Right, right. And he's helping them out a little bit. Um, And the people who are workers, he treats them when they come back from the camps. But he can't stop over-prescribing narcotics. And he would get convicted again in 1942. You need to stop doing crimes. Just stop. You're not good at it. You're not good. You keep getting caught. Yeah. Stop it. Um, After this, with the big narcotic scandal of 1942, he takes on a new name. He becomes Dr. Eugene and sets up a false escape network for resistance fighters. Now, this is kind of where I think this is probably the scummiest thing I would say this man does. So just kind of like in America during like, Slavery times, we had the Underground Railroad. It, this was kind of the same thing, but for Jews and other people that the Gestapo were looking for, they created these kind of networks that were underground. Except Pichot's were all fake. He called it fly talks, and he told these people that he was connected with the Argentinian authorities, and he could get people transported from France to South America. And he didn't do this out of the kindness of his heart. He charged 25,000 francs. So I looked this up and it's about 28,000 US dollars, but that was in 1942. Inflation makes that over 400,000 US dollars that he was taking from people. This was people's entire life savings. Uh, just to get this to get out of 
whatever to well, get the safety. Essentially, people were giving <clears throat> their entire life savings with the opportunity to potentially get away from France and World War II. Right. Totally understandable. And I mean, that. Yeah, I would. I would probably be one of those people who bought into it and then get killed. Yep, <laughs> definitely. Um, also, he offered it to criminals too and other members of the resistance. Oh, come on. But he had three accomplices: Raoul Ferrer, Edmund Pintard, and Rene Gustave Nezendet. And their main job was to go and find people and direct them to Doctor Eugene. So once he met the victims, he told them that he needed to get them inoculated in order to travel. But instead, he was injecting them with cyanide. He would steal all of their valuables, collect their money, and dispose of the bodies. Now, this becomes a big business. And he starts disposing them first by throwing them in the Seine River. But that becomes too obvious, so he sets up a quicklime basement in his backyard. But that's not doing it fast enough. So he starts trying to incinerate the bodies in the fire. What do you call that? Oh, my goodness. It would be like a boiler room type situation in a, in a regular house, but this is the 40s, so I can't exactly remember what you would put it in. But he's incinerating these people in his basement. Oh, oh, yeah. I wouldn't know what they call it either. Like I can't a, remember. Like a furnace? Yeah, like in the furnace in his basement, which is not logical at all because a furnace does not get hot enough to completely destroy a body. No. Like bodies are cremated at 2,000 to 3,000 degrees, depending on the size of the person. But listen, this is what he's doing. And this is all happening in this house that he bought in 1941. That's down the street from the Arc de Triomphe. Do you know what that is? I have no idea. Okay. Well, if you go to Paris right now, the Arc de Triomphe is those beautiful giant arches. Oh, yeah. Yes. One of the largest tourist attractions, both then and now. Oh, my God. People are going to hate me because I don't know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> you knew what it was by looking at it. Yes, those really beautiful yes. arches. That's the Arc de Triomphe. And I didn't know the name. My it's bad. one of the biggest, but it's one of the biggest tourist attractions in all of France outside of, oh my gosh. The Eiffel. Yes, the Eiffel <laughs> Tower. You're being so silly. <laughs> I was um, going to say, I don't know, the, the Louvre, the Eiffel Tower. Yes, yes. Uh, but outside of the Louvre and the Eiffel Tower, these are these are the places you go when you go to visit Paris for the first time. So he's literally like a couple blocks away from the biggest tourist attraction in his city, burning bodies and dumping them in the backyard. Oh my God. So he's burning people. He's burning people right by. Oh my goodness. Yes. Yes. There are people just walking around. just like, what's, what's that smell? Hmm. Well, here's the thing though. This didn't exactly go on as long as he wanted it to. Our boy Marcel really struggles with keeping a low profile. Um, and it isn't long before the Gestapo find out about him in this underground route. Now, they assume the doctor is a member of the resistance, and they try and set up a sting operation. And they force a prisoner, whose name is Ivan Dreyfus, to go to the network, and Dreyfus just disappears. I'm assuming he gets murdered by Dr. Pichot. Um, and they keep trying until someone actually makes it through. And then they arrest uh, Fourier, Pintard, and Nezendet. Now, after being tortured, they tell the Gestapo that Eugene is actually Dr. Marcel Pichot, and they pick him up, too. So they decide here to release Nezendat, because I guess he must have been the one who turned first. Mm -hmm. They keep the others and Pichot and his wife in prison for, I believe, eight months under suspicion of helping Jews escape. And they keep asking them, you know, who are the other members of the resistance? Where are the resistance camps? But these people don't know because they literally aren't working with the resistance. It's all fake. It's I'm all fake. About. Okay, look, look. Let me break it down to you, Rella. Okay, look, listen. It's fake. They're okay? like, we don't know anyone from the resistance. We, were just, we don't know. We were just, we were just using this to kill people. Okay, that's all we were doing. We just kill people. Um, they finally all get released January 1944. Now, two months later, March 11th, 1944, Pichot's neighbors have had it up to here. They've made local complaints, you know, the, the neighborhood watch. People have talked about it. But finally, they're like, okay, there's this horrible smell coming from this man's house. And giant dark clouds of smoke are coming from the chimney. I can only assume that he must have been burning the bodies maybe in smaller pieces or in small amounts. And maybe in this instance, he was doing too many at once. Mm -hmm. Because kind of like when you burn a, a green branch, 
it releases a different sort of smoke right, right. than something that's dry and brittle. So this was giving off a different sort of smoke than should normally be coming from a chimney. So what you're saying is that you should have just dried the bodies out. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Then it would have just been regular gray smoke. But for some reason, this thick, dark black smoke is coming out of his chimney and people are worried. So they call the police and the police are like, oh, that's probably a house fire. So they call the firemen who walk into this guy's house and stumble across 10 bodies in various states of decomposition. They find bodies in the backyard in a quicklime pit. And they also find body parts in canvas bags. Then they find suitcases and property of some of his victims. This is immediately international news. And it's in all of the papers reaching as far as Switzerland and Belgium. Pichot goes into hiding. He tells his friends that the Gestapo are after him for his work with the resistance because he killed German informants. He imp- <laughs> Why are you always lying? <laughs> oh, oh my God. Stop in lying. I know, I know. <laughs> he moves in with one of his patients named uh, Georges Rudow and he lets his beard grow out and he begins using many of the different aliases that he has during this time. But he, he settles on one. Henry Valeri. And how, how, is, how is one a Larry? Oh my gosh. How, uh, what are you doing? Henry You're making Val- dad jokes? <laughs> <laughs> but he changed his name to Henry Valeri. He grows, he grows up that mustache. And he joins what's called the French's, French Forces of the Interior. Which are uh, French forces. They're like slightly different than regular French cops. But regardless, he joins and he's immediately very good at this job of being a cop. And he rises to the rank of captain quite quickly. So that fall, a newspaper called Resistance runs a story about Dr. Marcel Pichot and accuses him of being a German collaborator. Police begin searching for him again, this time very seriously. And they draft Captain Henry Valeri to find this dangerous fugitive. Now, Pichot's biggest mistake here in all of this is that he sends his attorney a letter asking the attorney to tell the public that the newspaper is full of lies. This alerts the police to the fact that Pichot is still in Paris. Until then, they thought that he had left town. <clears throat> a month later, October 31st, 1944, he is recognized and arrested in the Paris Metro, which is their subway. On him, he's got 31,000 francs, a pistol, and 50 different sets of false identification. I don't know if he was deciding to leave at this point. Like, he was trying to just dip because, as we know, we said 28,000 was about 400,000 US dollars. Yeah. So we're talking about about 500K. He was ready to bounce. He was ready to leave. Yeah, he was getting out of there. Um, During, I mean, at this point, they take him, they rip apart his house, and they find roughly the remains of about 26 different bodies. 26, 27, they're not quite sure. Um, The trial is a big deal. It's a huge spectacle. And he swears that he is a member of the resistance and that he only ever killed enemies of France. He claims that he discovered the bodies in his home after he was released from the Gestapo because he was in prison with the Gestapo for eight months. And he assumed, he was like, listen, just like you, uh, they must have been, uh, the other collaborators with me in the resistance must have left these bodies in my house. I mean, I let people stay there while I was gone. I have no idea where these bodies came from, officer. But the police check, and he actually doesn't have any friends in any of the major resistance camps. Some of the groups that he said he was a part of didn't even exist. And coincidentally, when he originally was interrogated, he admitted to killing 19 German collaborators between 1940 and 1945. But they decided to actually charge him with the evidence they found when they had pretty much pulled apart his house. And like I said, if you're watching YouTube, I am... There's loads of pictures I'm going to be throwing up here right now. They ripped his house apart. There's loads of photos of him, like piles of stuff out in the streets. Like they were like, we're going to pull it apart. 
Unlike that movie we watched the other night where there was clearly a wall that needed to be ripped down because there were definitely bodies oh my behind God. that wall. Wasn't that last night? Oh my yes. goodness. Yes. Yes. <laughs> And there were clearly bodies behind that wall. The French police were not having it. They were like, listen, there could be bodies in this wall and we're going to break them down. So uh, ultimately they can only determine 26 different people from these remains. Um, He keeps saying that 19 were part of the 65 enemies he killed. His lawyer tries his best to portray him as a resistance hero, but the jury and the judge are just not impressed. Probably because Pichot decided to taunt the prosecution during his trial. So not only is he, like, not exactly the smartest, but he's also real arrogant. Let me just poke that bear real quick. Mm-hmm. Look like you're taking a good nap. We'll and poke. here's the best part about this. Not only is he found guilty of murder for profit, they also charge him with 135 other crimes. And he is sentenced to execution by way of the guillotine. His last words on March 25th, 1945 were... Gentlemen, I ask you not to look. This will not be very pretty. And thus ends one of the most ridiculous and incredible criminal careers I have ever read about in my entire life. Nice, nice, nice. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Every time I kept like looking up information about this guy, it was just, that's what I said to you when I was telling you about this, that there were so many opportunities in this person's life to direct this in a different location, to cut him off at the yeah, pass. Like, you could have stopped this way before all this happened. And, nope, let me just uh, let this go. And there you go. Multiple people dead. I mean, even the situation with the teen girl who he was dating, and I have my feelings about how teenagers should not be dating people in their mid 20s, but whatever. Right, right. right and um, right. we're not going to talk about that today, but. Just, he puts a trunk in his car and the neighbors are like, hey, we saw him with a trunk like that one that you found in the river the other day. And the police just go, nah, it's just a coincidence. That's not the, you, you're, you're crazy. What are you talking about? And I find that overwhelmingly, these cases, especially in the past, didn't get like we have so many unsolved cases and and so many situations like this because the police were just like what you gonna do i don't know the john mulaney oh yes <clears throat> yes we could spend hours discussing the police in the john Bene ramsey case and how they just <clears throat> didn't do anything yes but no is that that john mulaney when he did that one um that one bit with the cops and, and it's like detectives from like the 50s and he's like, and they're like, um, that's a pile of blood. That's a puddle of blood. Gross. Someone mop that up. Anyway, back to my hunch. <laughs> it's really accurate. The police in the past just, I don't know what police work was back then. I don't know. I, I can't tell you. It was just, I think it was just drilling darts at boards. Ooh, yes, yes. The, yes. That lets you know. And then you have to. The, okay, from the pins you put in the board, you have to wrap a little oh, yarn yes. around it oh, and gonna, then draw a connection to another spot. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly <clears throat> what needs to happen. Charlie here. Day, let's go. All right, so this next part of our podcast is uh, part of the Creeps of Brian. I think that's what we're calling it. We're calling it something. <laughs> that's your at least your TikTok name. There you go, Creeps of Brian. Um, goodness. All you now. Okay, so today I will be telling the story of James Dean in his car, his 550 Porsche Spider Little Bastard. This is a big deal. I I think I've heard a little bit about this in the past. Oh, I hope so. I no. didn't. Certain people have it, and bad things happen to every person who owned it. That, that's some speculations. Yes. Okay. That's, there are some claims on this. Yes. Okay, I'm ready yes, to be yes, spooked. Yes, yes. I'm okay. ready. To, I'm ready for the spook. <laughs> All right, so for those of you who don't know James, who don't know who James Dean was, um, he was an American act- actor. His full name is James Byron Dean. Um, he was born February eighth, uh, Oh goodness, I did not. Nineteen thirty one. I did not. <laughs> <laughs> that date correct. Um, That's okay. In Marion, Indiana. But after the death of his mother, he had moved to Fairmount, Indiana. 
um, with his aunt and uncle. Like I mentioned before, James Dean was an actor. Mm -hmm. Uh, Some of his famous movies were Rebel Without a Cause, East of Eden, and Giant. I mean, he's well known as being, like, one of the cultural icons teen heartthrob oh yes like he paid he played that um he had the floofy hair and the stare yes what was it what was that there's a name for like how like the characters he played they were just like oh okay i got it for bad guys wasn't it rebel without a cause like he, they were the yeah, bad he, he teen played, boys he played like you know, like i mean rebels so <laughs> yeah yeah he played like the the teen heartthrob who was a bad boy very much like Johnny Depp in the beginning of his career with like Crybaby. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, definitely like this like bad, sullen teenage heartthrob. Absolutely. Um let's see. So Rebel Without a Calls mm-hmm. and Giant were both released after his death. Oh, oh wow, I didn't know that. Yes. Yes, yes. They were both released after his death. Um <clears throat> That's like the big movie he's known for. Which one? Rebel, Rebel Without a Cause. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. When I think of him, I think of that movie. The Giant came out after that one, uh, 1956. Okay, well, when did he die then? 1955. Okay. Yep. Uh, Dean became the first actor to receive a posthumous, uh, humorous. Posthumous. Posthumous? It's posthumous. Oh. Huh. <laughs> Academy Award no- nomination for Best Actor. Oh, okay. And it remains to be the, the only actor to receive. Two posthumous acting nominations. Okay, did he win though? I'm not sure. Probably not. If it's not, if you didn't notice it in your research, yeah, no, it did not come up. That it just it was nominations. They're like, yeah, he got nominated for Academy Award after he died, but uh, we're not going to give it to him. Yeah, I mean, hey, he got nominated. That's you know, that's basically all that matters. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just like many people, he had more than one passion in life. Okay. Could so he was guess? actor and, well, I, I kind of have an idea, since the cars were such a big deal here. Was he a driver or a he racer? Was, yeah, yeah. Yeah, his passion was going fast, like uh, Ricky Bobby. Oh. You gotta go fast. Gotta go fast. Like Sonic the Hedgehog. I was just about to say that. <laughs> <laughs> gotta go fast. It was a great movie. So, he had a thing for Porsches. Uh, okay. one, one of his first Porsches was a 356 Super Speedster. I couldn't tell you what that looked like, because I don't know cars, but I'm here, listening. Neither do I. So I don't know a lot about cars, but I know, like, if it's a Porsche and it has the words Super Speedster in it. Must be good. It must be good. Must be fast. It's a... Uh, it's the kind of car that a really, like, well-known Hollywood actor could buy. Right? Yeah. That's what, you know. <laughs> Gotta go fast. So he had attended uh, racing events before and after uh, Rebel Without a Cause. Mm-hmm. Uh, having success in his races with the Super Speedster, he sees another Porsche. Okay. The next one would be, would be his 1955 Porsche 550 Spider that he named Little Bastard. Okay, so this is the car that everyone wanted. Yes, it is a B E A U typical car. Oh, okay. It's 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 fuck. Okay, let me look it up. I want to see the Little Bastard. It, like I'm into old cars. Like I'm not. I don't know a lot about cars, but like I said, I, when I see an old car, I'm just like. Okay, okay, I get it, I get it. Yeah, when I see cars like that, I'm just like, ooh, my heart. <laughs> this is cute, this is a cute car. Like mm-hmm. I said, if you're watching on YouTube, we will put up all of these cars that Brian are mentioning, because some of us don't know cars like that. So he entered the Selena's, uh, the Selena's Road Race, which was scheduled on October 1st. Oh, so that's to, California. To, yes, to the 2nd, mm-hmm. which he unfortunately would not make. Oh, so he didn't die in a race. He did not die in a race. Okay. Ha-ha. <laughs> I, I don't know a lot about this, so <clears throat> I'm here for it. All right, so now we get to the bad part. So on September 30th, 1955, as he's on his way to the event with his stunt, his stunt co- uh, coordinator, Bill Hickman, uh, he's the, the, the photographer for Culliners. Uh, it's a national illustrated magazine. Mm-hmm. Uh, his name is Samford Roth. He's mm-hmm. a, he's the photographer and the German mechanic behind Dean Spider. His name is Roth Wutherich. German names are very hard. Yes, I cannot get that. I apologize if I got that wrong. I'm pretty sure I did. A German fan will let us know. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Dean was driving a little bastard to break it in. Uh, 
um, based on rules. Of, so, so it was a new car. It was a new car. He bought it a week before the race. That is like a party foul. Yeah. So you know he had a he had a break in with Rich who was a, who who was uh you know the mechanic on the car. Mm-hmm. He he had, he had suggested to Dean to break it in you know just drive it to the race so you know it gets its you know the, the gears turning. Yeah, but I feel like if you're a racer, you need to have a mastery of your car, not like ah oh, just break in a little bit. I mean, it's a Porsche. She's driven a Porsche before. I mean, listen, I'm not really a huge NASCAR fan, but I have gone to a race before, and I feel like. Those people have not only gotten their cars a week before the race. Oh, this is true. They do. They do practice. <laughs> Thank <laughs> do you. Practice. Thank you. Okay, you're, you're right. You're right. So maybe this is. I don't, I don't think this is like a NASCAR kind of race that they're that they're doing. Yeah, I don't exactly know what sort of racing you were doing in these sort of cars either. This looks like a luxury vehicle. It's it's not, but it's a it's a like it's. Compared to his other Porsche, this mm-hmm. one's like the actual, like an actual race car. Okay, like actual, okay. Actual, go fast, go fast. <laughs> did, they, did, they, did it tell you why he called it Little Bastard? I did not look that up. That's such an interesting name for the I know. car. I just wonder. But yeah, this is, okay, so. Okay, so Dean, James Dean and Wooster Rich, they were driving in Little Bastard. Right. And the other two were driving separately from it. So... Earlier that day, at I think it's three uh, thirty p.m., mm-hmm. Dean has gotten a speeding ticket on his uh, while driving a little bastard. Okay, it was three thirty. Um, so next part it wasn't that surprising. The next part that's coming up isn't that surprising. Okay. Um. So the crew was on her way to the event, uh, going down Route Forty Six. Um, another car was entering the intersection in front of Dean. Um, pretty sure the car cut Dean off. Like the cut, the car did not see Dean coming right. down the road. It was a Ford two door. Okay. Now, if you look it up, this is actually a nice car too. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but that's the thing with him not being a well seasoned yeah. racer. So, compared to the Ford, the little bastard was a lot smaller, like closer Low to the ground. Low to the ground, yeah. So. I can tell I, you, you, I can see how the Ford didn't see the the spider the spider coming up, but oh, imagine being the person who killed like James Dean. Oh, you would feel so bad. It's like it's like in in the other guys when oh, what's his name? Um, uh, the Yankee the Yankee Clipper. Okay, so, have you not seen? Mm-mm, sorry. Oh goodness, everybody, whoever have seen has seen the other guys. You know what I mean. Like it's like the Yankee Clipper, basically. Like you, you, you shot Derek Jeter in his leg. You ruined their season. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um. So the driver of the Ford, his name was Donald Turnip Turnip Seed. Um. So Dean saw the Ford coming out in front of him. So he started. He tried to slow down a little. You, you can tell he started. <clears throat> I'll explain that later. But. He tried to slow down a little bit. Okay. Um, and he impacted with the passenger side of the Ford, and the spider was thrown across the highway, so it, like, bounced across the highway. Oh, cra- Across the pavement. Crap. Yeah. Um, and Wilson Rich, he was thrown from the car. Oof. And Dean was, unfortunately, trapped inside the car. Okay. Uh, he suffered from several life-threatening injuries, including a broken neck. He made it to the hospital? On the scene. Um, okay, I, I didn't think one could survive through your neck breaking outside of like a Grey's Anatomy episode. So, <laughs> so as like, you, you, he was fading. He was fading okay. uh, as I loaded him into the ambulance. So, but they pronounced him DOA okay, when so he got he to the died ho- while he was in the hospital. I think it was like as soon as he hit the, you know, that, yeah, that on arrival when he got to the hospital. Okay. At the Apostle Rolls War Memorial Hospital. And that was at 6.20 p.m. Okay, so when do we get to the death car situation? What? Also, wasn't the, would the car be destroyed? How is it, like, so the, around? So the car was basically totaled by the insurance company. Okay. They told her that. Um, 
Let me just, let the me thing just, is, totaling just means it'll cost more to fix this car than the value of the car. Yeah, it costs more than it's worth to fix that car. So, Whistle Rich, he survived that car, uh, that crash. With wow. Like a, he had like a double fractured jaw and a serious hip injury and femur injuries. Okay. Um, Turn up Seed, the like, driver of the Ford, he only had minor injuries. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> now this is a quote straight from Wiki. It says, and requests into Dean a, a request into Dean's death occurred three days at the council chambers in St. Louis of this of uh, St. Louis Obispo? A, 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 yeah, that that Okay. <laughs> where the Sheriff Coroner's Jerry delivered a verdict that he was entirely at fault due to speeding. That oh. turnip seed was innocent of any criminal act. However, according to an article in the Los Angeles Times of October 1st, 2005, a former California Highway Patrol officer who had been called to the scene, uh, his name was Ron Niel- Nielsen, contradicted reports that Dean had been traveling at 90, mile per- <clears throat> 90 miles per hour, stating the wreckage and the position of Dean's body indicated his speed at the time of the accident was more like 55 miles per hour. So they're trying to blame him speeding based on a car. That he was driving, I think. Okay, but here's the thing, okay? Dialing back into that thing with NASCAR. Mm. The thing that I used to like about watching those races is that there would be an accident, right? Oh, okay. <laughs> this makes me seem like such a terrible person. But, like, maybe one person would, like, hit the wall or something. And then every other driver on the road would avoid them. It was actually, like, masterful driving. And that's what being a skilled racer is. Like, I... I incredible crashes things flipping all this stuff happening and nobody's dead exactly like it's incredible but a person who doesn't know what they're doing driving at 90 miles per hour you're gonna kill somebody but he wasn't that's he what, wasn't no he wasn't that's what the the officer that came on the scene he uh, he so con- wait so he contradicted the coroner oh because he okay. was on the scene he could tell you know, how fast he was going right right so he said he wasn't going 90 per- miles per hour. He was going like 55 miles per hour. Okay, that's normal so then. So he had, like, you could tell he slowed down because he saw the Ford coming out of the road, uh, you know, out in front of him. And Did he slow down enough? 55 miles per hour. I mean, they're still going like 60 on the highway. It's not that slow. You need that six car lines. This is true. <laughs> Speaking as the one who doesn't have a driver's license. <laughs> so, yeah, so apparently he was trying to slow down, but. Obviously, he didn't slow down enough to avoid crashing into the side of the Ford. All right, we have a crash. So, I mean, he dies. Tell me about Little Bastard. Okay. So, yeah, we're getting to the, the haunted part. So, we're getting to Little Bastard. So, as a disclaimer, let me just state that the whole curse of Little Bastard may have just been made up by uh, an attention-seeking individual. He was, um, just, just, just listen to this, okay? Okay. We'll, we'll get to him soon. Okay. Okay. So, September 23rd, this is a week before Dean's accident. Okay. He had met up with a British act- actor. His name was Alec Guinness. Um, Guinness was a superstitious person. He told Dean that the sports car looked sinister. It looked exhausted, hungry, feeling a, a little ill-tempered in spite of Dean's kindness. That's how people talk about their cars, though. Really? Yes. It's ill-tempered? My one friend, like, talks about his car and, oh, this is my baby, and it's okay, baby, and I don't know. Car people are a little weird. Like, I'm weird, <laughs> but car people are their own kind of weird. I'm feeling called out a little bit. I mean... Are you a weird car people? Look, I kind of say my car is, my car is iffy sometimes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you call her... You call... Is it a her? It's a... It's a guy. Oh, it's a guy car. Yeah, it's a guy car. I've been in a guy car. His name is Jamel. <laughs> Okay, so you are car people. <laughs> um, he said he. I heard myself saying in a voice I could hardly recognize as my own. Please never get in it. If you get in that car, you'll be found dead in it by this next next time this week. So okay. what happened next week? He dies. He dies. <laughs> <laughs> so after the accident, uh, the car was considered a total loss by the insurance company. Um, but it was sold by a salvage yard in Burbank, California, to Dr. William F. Now, I cannot pronounce his last name. 
<laughs> I was going to try my my best to estrach. Estrich? Estrich. Yeah, usually C-H is a K sound. Estrich. Yeah, okay. Estrich. So, who had, he had raced before against Dean. Um, so, he, he had salvaged parts of the engine. Okay. And put them in his Lotus IX race car. Okay. Um, another another driver used parts of the Little Bastard as well. His name was Trey McHenry. Okay, so it was worth something. Yes, the, the parts of the car. Because, you know, you could salvage some parts. from I mean, it wasn't completely unsavable, I guess, at that point. Okay. So, after salvaging what he needed... Uh, he sold it, um, this is, um, Estrich. Estrich, okay. Estrich. Uh, he sold the chassis of the little bastard to a name, a man named George Barris. Okay. Who had, um, customized some of the cars that were in Rebel Without a Cause. Okay. And he's also the self-proclaimed king of customizers. Oh, okay. Yes, yes, yes. So, a pimp my ride kind of guy. Uh, basically, he's exhibit. All right, back in then. the 50s. Okay. <laughs> or whoever it was at West Coast Customs. Yeah. Oh my God, yeah. Yeah, the guy who ran that thing that Pimp My Ride was about. Okay. Um. So the only incident that happened at, at Estrich while using the parts from Dean's car okay. was a minor shunt with another driver. Okay. And that was during the Pomona Sports Car Races. And okay. that was in October 21st, 1956. Okay. So... Unfortunately, McHenry, who had also used parts of his car, uh, <clears throat> he was using the back swing arms of the little bastard. Okay. <clears throat> I know you don't know about cars. I'm guessing the little back bumpy things. <laughs> <laughs> keep going, keep going. It's all right. Someone out there listening to this knows what you're talking about. They they hold the rear, the rear end of the car. Okay. So I think you're kind of right. <laughs> I <think. laughs> I, I'm just looking at the picture of the car and I'm like, those little bumps, those little back bumps. Back bumps? A little butt. Butt of the car. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, goodness. Okay. So he was in the same race as Estrich. Um, that he got, that Estrich got in a little chunk with the other racer. Mm-hmm. So, but McHenry lost control of the car and struck a tree. Okay. And he died. And this is to, to be the only actual death caused by parts of the car. Okay. Well, so why is it all spooky then? So let's get to that. Okay. George Barris. Like I said uh, before. Was he haunted by James Stewart? <laughs> no, that would actually be justice then. But um, like I said before, he had customized some cars in uh, Rebel Without a Cause mm-hmm. and self proclaimed King of Custom- Customizers. He had bought the wreck of the chassis from you know Estrich. So... He he announced Barris. He announces that he's going to rebuild the little bastard, but you know, oh. that 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 um that was uh too much for him. It was like it was a freaking it was a wreck. The, okay. the chassis so it's was a wreck. Expensive and time consuming. Like no, it, it, like the the chassis when it's when it's total and it's like crushed like that is like it has basically it says it has no integral okay strength. Okay. So, Instead, Barris decided to weld aluminum sheets, uh, sheet metal over the caved-in front fender and the cockpit area. Okay. He proceeded to beat on aluminum panels with a two by four to try to simulate what would appear to be a collim- uh, collision damage. Uh, that's so, kind of gross. So he, yeah, so he he like tried. Not to, only did he try and rebuild it, but he tried to rebuild it like it looked like it was in an accident. Oh, that's kind of gross. Yeah, yeah. This is um. This is pretty bad. <laughs> he he basically bought the car just to show it off and try to make money and get some publicity from it. Yeah, I mean, can you imagine? What was his name? Paul Walker? Somebody buying Paul Walker's car oh and being God. like, I'm going to show you the car exactly as it looked when it hit the pole. That's really kind of awful. That's messed up. This is real messed up. So then he left the, uh, he lent the car to the Los Angeles chapter of the National Safety Council for a local rod and custom sum. Um, during 1957 and 1959, the exhibit was toured in various rod and custom car shows. Okay. Movie theaters, bowling alleys, highway safety displays, through, all throughout California. So, Barris is believed to be the creator 
of the myths behind the little bastard. Okay, so they think he made this up so, as a means to make money. Yes. Um, oh, that probably, probably that takes away some it. of the excitement of the story. I know. I'm sorry, but let me get to some of the creepy tales that he's told in some of the creepy tales that may or may not have happened. Okay. Okay. So, I got this information from Comet Over Hollywood. So, it says, Bears had two tires from the spider and sold them. The tires apparently both blew out simultaneously. Oh, I cannot speak. Simultaneously. There you go. Words. (laughs) Causing the new tire owner's car to turn off the road. Which isn't that crazy of a story. Because they're older tires. Exactly. That had been an accident. Okay, see, this is... So... <laughs> this is not a spook, Brian. It's... It's a myth. Yes. I, yeah, I would agree. This is a myth. Uh, let's see. So, Barris had kept the Porsche, and two people tried to steal parts. Barris said one of the, su- the suspect's arms was torn completely open, trying to steal the steering wheel, and the other was injured trying to remove the bloodstained tartan seat. Okay, so now that feels a little Christina. Yes, yes. I love Christine. All right. That's why I did the car thing. I did the car thing because, you know, Christine. Okay. I was thinking of Christine. I was like, let me in. Yeah, let me get that. Um, in 1959, the Little Bastard was put on display by the California Highway Patrol for a safety exhibit. Supposedly, the patrol garage that housed the Porsche caught on fire, according to the death of Jane Dean by Warren Newton. Okay, Beth. so a book about yes. this. So, wherever the car was stored, I guess, the, the warehouse caught on fire. Now, that one's actually true. Oh, okay. Yeah. The the cause of the fire? Unknown. That's cool. Yeah. Okay. And supposedly, the poor spider was being transported when a driver of the truck, the truck that was towing the Porsche, mm-hmm. lost control. The driver apparently fell out of the truck and was crushed by the Porsche when it fell off the back. Oof. The car also fell off vehicles during other transports, so it would never stay still. Okay. Yeah. So none of these claims have been corroborated except for... The fact that every time it was stored somewhere, that place caught on fire. The fire and the death of McHenry. Okay. Those are only two. Otherwise, uh, it's be- it, we're, we're speculating that maybe Barris had... Maybe exaggerated a little bit on on his, you know, mm-hmm. cursed car. All right. And like, I'm not going to get too much into the bears stuff, but there's been some, uh, I guess, blowback towards him. Of course, there would be because of this, and just like, I mean, it's like it's you're kind of so- creepy. Yes, exactly. So is it okay? So is the car still around? I believe. Okay, so this is another report. So could you go and see it? I don't. We're gonna do a Google. <laughs> Google it. But um, Barris is he's also stated that the car has disappeared from him. Oh, as well. And some and has not been found. Hmm. Okay, so yeah. it's not around. Yeah. Oh, boo. I know you can't go to a museum and see it. Or see it on tour or nothing like that. I just thought maybe go to a museum. You know. Let's see. Let's see Paul Walker's car. No. <laughs> oh, you're right. That is so awful. Uh, but the, the dark macabre and Yes, I know. No. Wants to... It's like going to. Well, it's like, okay, there's that whole Titanic museum that's yes. in that boat and they have things that they got from the titanic which they shouldn't really have because most of that stuff's supposed to be at the bottom of the ocean still but whatever um is that in a mummer's re- museum the mummer's museum is that what it's called in philadelphia oh you mean the the museum of the college of physicians museum what is it called mutter mutters mutter museum it's or, the, it's i don't know why it's called mummers it's called the college of physicians of philadelphia that's the one that has the soap lady. I love that. Oh, yes. She's the lady who they found in the mass grave in Philadelphia and her body turned into soap. Yes. It was lovely. It's just a big blue blob. I was so <laughs> enamored with that when I was younger and I couldn't wait to go to the Modern Museum. And I was just like, it's a big blue blob. But interestingly enough, they did a 
x-ray not an x-ray an mri mm. recently and her skeleton is in there really yeah it didn't dissolve or anything into the it's still there wow they also used to have a what's that guy who's the russian he was like they thought he was a wizard rasputin yes they had his penis for a while really yep it's back in russia now though it's of still course. weird that that's a thing that people want to see look and strangely i would like to see it if you got it i want to see it <laughs> it's just like is this a magical penis yes he's a wizard <laughs> he's a, you're a wizard harry <laughs> All right then. <laughs> and that's all. I, that's that's the story of James Dean and the curse of myth class slash curse of little bastard. All right. Well, thank you so much for listening. I want to remind you again that our sponsors for this podcast today are the Magic Class, and you can use the word the code caught C A U G H T to get fifteen percent off your order, as well as Anchor FM, which is where we post this podcast, and they are also our sponsors. Thank you so much for listening. This was our first very clunky but fun podcast that we Ooh, did. Yes, very first podcast. Very <laughs> I, fun. Again, uh, if you want more content in the meantime, you can find me at Caught Podcast on TikTok. I post every single day and I do lives multiple times a week. And uh, you can find more from Brian at Creeps with Brian, but he doesn't post a whole lot. I'm trying to make him do that. Tell more spooky stories. I, you have I, the voice for it. I'm on TikTok, Creeps with Brian. <laughs> Look me up. I'll post more us. if I get more followers. There you go. <laughs> Add, get okay. So follow Brian on Creeps with Brian on TikTok so he can tell us spooky stories. All right, everyone, you have a great evening or morning whenever you might happen to be listening to this. And thank you for listening to When Killers Get Caught. Bye bye. <laughs>